Lawrence Kessenick is a poet and playwright. Born in Wisconsin, he started writing poetry in high school where he was dealing with his management of emotions and feelings and found poetry gave it great voice. And he was influenced uh, by the likes of writers as Rod McEwen, E.E. E. Cummings, and Paul Simon. He enjoyed the writing so much he began with a friend to create a poetry supplement to the high school newspaper. Also, that Lawrence had a love of theater. And as he went on to college, he was studying theater and taking classes and getting involved in acting and held on to that. Thought he was interested in writing and directing plays, but it was only until 10 years ago with the onset of the 10 minute play that is what clicked for Lawrence and he began writing them. And since then, uh, they have been uh, produced out in Boston, New York City, Oregon, and Colorado. And uh, one of them received People's Choice Award over in Colorado. And he has written one full-length play, and it's been a finalist of if 20 out of 300. Lawrence has also worked in the editorial department for Houghton Mifflin many years as an editor. And he said one of the things that taught most to him is about the importance of being objective in writing, and also that it is very hard to be objective as a writer. And he has found it's helpful to have friends take a look at his writing when he is about to share it out in public or submit. And he said that he also learned that the attention that a writer gets is only brief out there, so you better be writing because you love the process, because that is what you're going to be doing about 95% of the time. His poetry has been published in a number of journals. He has a chapbook, Strange News, published in 2008. He won the Strokestone International Poetry Prize and uh, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize with his poem, Underground Jesus, most recently as a full-length book of poetry, Before Whose Glory. <coughs> And when asked for a memorable moment of sharing his work, Lawrence mentioned, uh, especially with a play that uh, had gone on stage about losing a son to Vietnam, and he was moved by the number of people who came up after him and told him how moved indeed they were by words that were put to uh, theater and acting. And I will end with a comment uh, that Lawrence gave about the process of writing. He said that, I believe that my best writing comes through me, not from me, and that my job is to make myself a clear conduit for stories. So we look forward to hearing the results of such a creative process. With some poetry and perhaps a sample of his play, please give a warm welcome to Lawrence Kesenick. This play is um, is one that grew out of the fact that I, I grew up Catholic, and uh, I noticed started noticing around Boston that uh, a lot of schools, some of them Catholic, some of them public, uh, elementary schools and high schools were being turned into condos, and I suddenly thought, what would it be like? if you got a condo in the place you went to elementary school. Very strange. So this is a story about a man named Sean uh, here in Boston who gets a condo at uh, the Sacred Heart Condos. <laughs> and it's funny, because I, I, I wrote to a friend who's a poet that, that I was doing this play, and she lives in uh, the Sacred Heart uh, Convent in, I think it's Medford. They're actually, you know, it's actually, so it's just funny, but uh, closer to the truth than I even imagined. But um, he's a gay man, and that enters into this too, and it involves him and his friend Becky. Now, Becky has a bit of a salty tongue, so we've toned her down a little for uh, cable TV. <laughs> and when the when this the part that I'm going to read starts, he's just talked to his uh, his uh, the, the real estate agent who sold him the place has just left. She just stopped in to see how things were going. Sean's cell phone rings. 
He pulls it from his pocket, looks at the caller ID, smiles, and answers. Hi, Becky. Guess where I'm standing? On the spot where I used to say mass in second grade. Remember that? I know you were ticked off. You didn't get to dress up and say mass too, but that's our good old Catholic church. Yeah, the place is mine, memories and all. Why don't you come over? Oh, come on, I've been here for a month. You haven't even seen the place and you're two minutes away. You're a peach. See you in a couple. I've known Becky since first grade. Her name is Hartwell and mine is Harris. And we were always arranged alphabetically, so she sat right behind me. By third grade, we were best friends. By high school, we even tried dating, but it never worked out. For one thing, we were way too honest with each other. Love can only survive so much of that. And then, of course, there was the fact that I finally accepted being gay. Speaking of heartthrobs from grade school, what's now my bedroom, right over there, was part of my fourth grade classroom. I sat behind Jerry Koleski that year. He had curly, golden blonde hair and big brown eyes. I felt stirrings I couldn't even name, but I knew enough to feel guilty about them. I would do anything to get a smile out of him, but he was pretty stingy with them, although that just made it more exciting when I actually got one. Ah, Jerry, my first love probably explains my habit of chasing unavailable men. Sean goes to the window, stage right, and looks down. The parking lot is where the playground used to be. I had fun down there. Kickball, capture the flag, wiffle ball, red rover, chasing Jerry around the swings during tag. <laughs> there were a couple of bullies, but I never had any trouble with them. Not that I was tough, far from it. But somehow I was able to convey that I wouldn't be picked on, and they always chose somebody else to push around. Thank God they didn't know I was gay. I hardly knew myself. The lobby buzzer sounds. Sean goes to the wall near the door and presses the button to talk. Is that you, Becky? No, it's the effing queen of England. Buzz me in, will you? Sean presses the button. You'll like Becky. She's a character. A little overwhelming sometimes, but she has a good heart. She's gotten me through some rocky times, and vice versa. People as honest as Becky have a way of getting themselves into trouble. She's always been that way, even in grade school. Nobody messed with Becky. The nun tried, nuns tried, but they never got anywhere. There was a loud, distinctive knock on the door. Sean opens it. Enter Becky. Good evening, Miss Sharp. Thanks for doing me the honor. You sounded like you were going to cry if I didn't, Chinny, so here I am. And don't call me that. That Becky Sharp is a nasty piece of work. She's not nasty. She just stands up for herself like you've always done. Besides, if you can call me Shinny, I can call you Miss Sharp. Turnabout is fair play. Yeah, well. You know I'm breaking my vow to never, ever return to this damn school. You'd better appreciate it. Of course I do, sweetheart. Well, what do you think? It's just like you said, high ceilings, great sunlight, but it's still the effing Sacred Heart grade school. Take a look at the bedroom. It's pretty amazing. He points stage left. Through that door. Yeah, it's amazing, all right. Isn't this about where our fourth grade classroom was? It is indeed. Part of it anyway, very observant of you. Damn, Sister Albert used to patrol this room like a tank. God knows she was almost as big as one. Remember how she used to roll around the room, her nasty little fists balled, her beady eyes picking out any kid who was slouching or not paying attention or who, uh, whom, she would have corrected me, whom she just didn't like or downright hated the way she did me. That was the most miserable year of my life, up to that point anyway. It was a class thing, Becky, you know that. Remember the stories we used to hear about her being from that filthy rich department store family down in Connecticut? She smelled the sweat of the workmen on you, buddy. She actually cringed that day she asked everybody what their fathers did and you said yours was a janitor. She did? I would have knocked her effing block off if I'd noticed that. 
Hey, remember when you clocked Mr. Grundy in eighth grade gym class? Damn right I clocked him. Clocked him. He was grabbing my butt. Of course, I was the one who got into trouble. They wouldn't believe he'd done it. They tell you to defend your purity, and then they suspend you when they do. When you do. Jerks. God, I thought you were amazing, Becky. I was so naive. I couldn't conceive of anybody in authority doing anything wrong. But not you. You called them on everything. Hey, that's not your fault, Shinny. You were just channeling John and Rose. Your folks were the straightest arrows I've ever seen in my life. They weren't much for seeing the dark side, were they? Seeing it? I'm not even sure they knew it existed, at least in not in any priest or nun. Hey, can I get you a beer? I thought you'd never ask. Since when do you need to be asked? You usually beat a path to the fridge. I'm trying to learn some manners in my advanced age. You're not going soft on me, are you, Miss Sharp? Just trying to fit into the world a little better, Shinny, like you've always been trying to get me to do. God knows this school didn't do much for me in that department. Only because you wouldn't cave. They would have been happy to knock off all your rough edges and roll you out into the world with the rest of us. Let me get those beers. Sean exits stage right. Becky studies the ceiling, suddenly sees something, and sits up, still looking at it. Damn, I remember that knot hole on that beam. I can't believe it's still there. It always looked like a fish to me, a fish out of water. Yeah, yeah, I know. You don't need Carl Jung to figure that one out. When Sister Joseph Marie put us in the corner, she made us face the class instead of the wall. I guess she thought it was more humiliating if you had to watch everyone in the class looking at you. But I'd just stare everybody down, and then I'd study my fish. God, so any time I got down, I'd look up at Captain Hook, that's what I named him, <laughs> and I wouldn't feel so out of place. He was out of place, too. But he managed to endure. Nice work, Hook. <laughs> Thank you. So if you want to see how it works out in the end, you'll have to come to the play or ask me later. So I am going to read some, some poems. And, and uh, I've often been told that, that my poems often, come off as, poems often come off as little stories. So it's a good, I'm a good person to fill in for a storyteller, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and continuing on, since we're on this uh, Catholicism, Catholicism theme. Uh, I have a, an acquaintance who's a poet and a painter. Uh, her name is Mary Lane Phipps Kettlewell. And she's very a very devout uh, Catholic and uh, has a take on the world that not that many people do anymore. And this is kind of about, about that attitude. And it's called The Poet's Heart. The world so often disappoints her its cocktail party banter and casual affairs like salt in her wounds. She wears the wounds of Jesus, paints with his blood, expects more of the people he saved. If only they knew what it was like to meet him beneath palm trees in the Caribbean as a child, to feel him close as a lizard on her hand, tiny spikes clinging to innocent flesh to breathe with him beneath white, wet, white netting in the humid night. Then they could not break his heart like a cheap wine glass, sully his memory by flaunting love and feasting on self-indulgence. Not that she is austere. She paints in reds, blues, oranges, and yellows. Her words are blazing suns, bright flowers, colorful insects. She savors food, wine, beautiful clothes, and good company. But she craves a life among adults, not giant children who cannot wait to feel the sugar syrup dripping down their chins, who know only their own desires, refuse to be wounded in order to live. That's a, a newer poem. I'm going to read a few from, I'm just going to read five poems, read a few from, uh, 
for my book as well. <clears throat> and again, just I just thought I had this theme going. I would go with it. I had a, uh, a friend who was raised Presbyterian, uh, but one time he ended up staying with, uh, with someone who was Catholic and experienced the grandeur of ca Catholic mass for the first time. And this, this relates that experience. It's called Blazing Heart. The blazing heart of Jesus in the gaudy print on the dark living room wall frightened him most of all. He sat pressed against the sofa arm close to the end table with the painted plaster statue of Mary holding baby Jesus. His own mother was traveling the world with his siblings while he'd been dumped on their Irish cleaning woman who lived behind closed shades, summer barely sneaking in around the edges. The only saving grace was Saturday night, Saturday night in the vast tiled space of Miami Cathedral where he could trade his family's stark Presbyterianism for Catholicism's sensual delights. Dip his fingers into cool holy water, fill his eyes with jeweled stained glass and life-sized statues. Breathe in the exotic sweetness of incense and beeswax candles that made the air itself glow. When the mass commenced, the choir burst into joyful song. The priest entered in his colorful robes, preceded by his acolytes, mounted the steps to the altar, chanted Latin incantations like a magician, eventually raised the golden cup. Turning the wine, she whispered to him, into Jesus' blood, the bright white host into his body, which the boy was not privileged to eat. He returned home exhausted from the pageantry, face flushed with excitement. In bed, he lay on his back in thin pajamas, covers kicked off in the heat, clutching in his sweaty fist a plastic figurine of the mother of God the cleaning woman had given him, imagining his own mother as she traveled further and further away. So I am, I am not a practicing Catholic anymore, and um, my, I tend to have, well, some of my experience was that there was a little bit of a life-hating quality in, in, in the way I was taught uh, in the school I went to, and, and so a lot of my poetry tends to reflect a more loving attitude toward life. This story actually, again, comes from someone I know. This is a, a woman, woman who's been cutting my hair for over 30 years, and she came to the United States from Italy at about 11 or 12 years old, and I love it when she's, I love Italy, I've only been there once, but I loved it, and she's, she tells me stories about growing up there, and this poem is, is based on one of those. It's called Angelus Formena. In Campania, at her grandfather's farm, field stone house secure as a castle, she sleeps beneath the high eaves, underhung with swallows' nests like pots of clay. She walks the vineyards with him, too small to see over the vines, her eyes full of leaves, fat grapes, and overhead the bellies and wings of birds about their business. She longs to see the birds, to be the birds. He lifts her high to look into their nests, at perfect oval eggs, at hatchlings, scrawny, pink, and vulnerable. When he arises to work the fields, barking dogs wake her. She listens to the newborn swallows just outside her shutters, crying for their breakfast with the dawn. From her bed, she stares up at the vaulted ceiling, at the painted angel flying around the light fixture, naked save the loincloth rippling across his muscular thighs. His wings are white as a swallow's belly, and from a basket on his arm, he strews flowers across a faux sky, each growing brighter as the sun outside rises higher. Finally, she throws off the covers, pulls the shutters open, sunlight like a hundred chandeliers, bathes the angel in glory and herself in joy.
And the last two poems I want to read are uh, sort of my own stories, stories from my own life. Excuse me. <clears throat> this one is called Black Swans. In Well, the Netherlands, my daughter spends a semester in a castle, transformed into a college campus, fulfilling countless childhood dreams and fantasies. Depressions are worn into ancient stone stairways. Bunk beds line the massive walls of a room that might have been a prince's. Computers glow coolly beneath a low beamed ceiling. From the parapet, we look west over trees to the tiny town, then down on the double moat, one bordering the estate, the other tucked neatly against castle walls. In the nearer one, two black swans with orange beaks sail regally. They've been known to chase visitors across the broad lawns, honking madly. This is the longest my daughter has lived away from home. She's learned to drink beer and, we suspect, taken a professor for a lover. Part of me would like to be angry at this dark prince of learning, but I can't be sure I'd be able to resist if I taught young women the temptation to wind myself around them like the lithe mus muscular neck of a black swan. Besides, our sons and daughters sail their own moats, honking madly if we get too close. It's their castle, and they will defend it. <laughs> and finally, I want to read a, a poem about, from, from my childhood um, about my father, who is, uh, his full-time job was in the National Guard. A lot of people don't realize that there, somebody actually has to set up all these things that the weekend warriors go and do, and that was his job. He, he did that full-time for, for most of his life. And part of the requirement uh, for everybody is that there's a summer training camp that goes for a week or two, and uh, we used to go visit him there. And um, this is a story about doing that. Uh, the, the officers club in this particular camp, it's Camp McCoy in Toma, Wisconsin, uh, the, they call the officers club the Blue Goose for unknown reasons, but that's what it's called. So this is called Drinks at the Blue Goose. It was as near to drinking that adult rite of passage we could get as boys when our father, Major Kessenick, a stern or playful man by turns, escorted us to the officers' club at Camp McCoy, showing us off like a proud gander at the Blue Goose. As we walked, enlisted men passing in open jeeps or crunching along the white gravel paths between barracks saluted Dad, who took it as his due, saluting them back without breaking stride while we puffed out our chests, saluting, too, our egos big as howitzers. The blue goose was dim inside. Our entrance sent a blaze of sunlight across the polished floor. The handful of officers gathered at that early hour looked up and smiled. The bartender, a balding sergeant with a gold tooth, boomed, what's your pleasure, gentlemen? Our pleasure was ginger ale, and being there among the men in uniform as they whacked their brown leather dice cup on the burnished bar, played cribbage, and caught themselves about to swear, unspoken words hanging in the air like the girly calendar on the wall. The sergeant poured our drinks in highball glasses just like dad's cold golden bubbles rising to the top and clinging to the ice cubes like diamonds. A drink that looked exactly like champagne. The drink of those who have everything they want. Thank you. Sometimes, 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 times like these, you just, I got to speak beyond the words. I try to make sense. I try to make sense. I try to make sense of this deep, deep skullduggery interwoven 
into the highest guidelines. Guidelines. Guy wires. Keeping this fabrication of normalcy in place like a circus tent. The big top. Globalization hypertrophy over the low bottom deprivation and depravity. Oh, there's got to be some better. There's got to be some better. There has got to be some better. Follow me down this side soliloquy. There is breathing room on the other side of the newscast. Let's take that breath and infuse it with the memory of who we really are. Thank you. March afternoon. It's March, snow still thick on the ground. It's almost spring. It's afternoon, red glow painted on the trees. It will soon be night. Morning will come, and the thaw. We will bury our dead. We will plant seed. <laughs> 